Essential social amenities in the Ketu South municipality are under threat as violent tidal waves continue to pound roads, residential buildings and schools. Some of the residents in one of the affected communities have started relocating a cemetery which has been partly submerged. The roads connecting communities from Salekope to Keta have deteriorated as a result of the tidal flooding. More than 1,000 residents are homeless and seeking shelter in a local church. Now, I'm currently at the Amachinu, Amuchinu uh, um, community, and the community school here itself is also getting its fair share um, uh, 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 of the devastation being caused by the high tides here in this part um, of the country. Uh, the students, when they are studying, the pupils, when they are studying, when they are in there, they can have a good view of, uh, 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 of the ocean. You've seen some of them there. Let's try and see if we can interact with some of them who were actually seated outside here um, studying. The sea, uh, first time, the sea, between, the distance between the sea is very far, but this, by this time, yeah, the sea is closer to us. Sometimes the sea can even come here, then we can flow through this area, then sometimes disturb our knowledge, we can't even learn. So, and we can't even focus to learn, because the way the sea it's coming to hit the wall. It the, hits the wall? Yeah, it hits the wall. Okay. And the sun is always disturbing us every day. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, now, you can see visible cracks already um, in this structure. Um, I'm told that this building used to be quite taller, you know, and uh, there was no way I was going to be able to reach the height of this um, school building. But now, because of um, the high tides and because the ocean is drawing closer, now it's very easy for me to even touch the ceiling here. So we have with us um, also um, here assessing the situation, the chairman for the um, voter, um, M voter region MP caucus, MP's caucus, Imano Kwesi Bedra, um, here um, with us. He's also on the ground assessing the situation. Um, Honorable, is your constituency affected by this? No, at all. Okay. Uh, I'm also a member of the Western Housing Committee. Uh, okay. Let me also add that we're here some years back okay. when the city defense, the first phase was completed. We're here mm. to inspect it. Mm. And, and so this place has not been reclaimed. And therefore, the easier way is for the city to pass here because this place has not been reclaimed. Yeah. And so we'll have this, you know, till it gets to a flower. Mm. Now, if we don't continue, if we don't complete the loop by, by claiming what the sea has taken, we'll have this problem forever. It, mm. It's not only perina, it will continue forever. And so my urgent appeal to this government is to continue the, the, the first phase. The I'll go live to Mark Solodoba at uh, the shelter at Salakope. Well, Maxwell, what can you report? Get to know the true length of a frog after it dies. Um, here at Salakofa, we're beginning to see the extent of damage um, caused by the um, high tides here um, in Salakofa as night falls. Um, now, I've seen quite a number of people um, moving to other communities um, to spend the night. Um, I've seen some of them boarding vehicles to go to um, Keta to go and spend the night. I've seen some of them moving to higher ground to go and spend the night. Um, some of the people I met who were on their way um, to do that um, told me that um, they, I mean, their buildings are still, I mean, they tell me that um, most of the things in their rooms are, are wet, their mattresses are wet as a result of the um, high tides that entered um, their rooms. So they are unable to sleep on their uh, mattresses and they are better off sleeping in the homes of families and um, relatives. I've seen some of them also boarding vehicles moving to other communities. But what is happening here, um, this church, which actually served as a shelter for most of the people who were uh, affected um, by the um, high tides, there's church service going on. So what it means is that for those who are using um, this church um, as a shelter, they would have to wait for church service to end before um, they can sleep. And you can see one of them is here. She's an old woman I mean, who is sitting here. She couldn't stand for this. She had to sit in on, on the chair so we could interact with her. There's another old woman up here, quite a number of them. I'm told some of them have moved to other communities already. Um, let me speak to her. Um, uh, okay. Um, in case of Jumpy, I don't know if you have a lot of money. I don't know if you have a lot of money. I don't know if you have a lot of money. I don't know if you have a lot of money. I don't know if you have a lot of money. I don't know if you have a lot of money. I don't know if you have a lot
So um, what she's saying um, is that she would have to wait for the church service um, to end before she can sleep. I asked her um, where is her house. She told me that her house has been submerged. And so she doesn't have any place where she would lay her head today. And she has to wait for the church service um, to end um, before. Malashiaba Ava Dukwayama Ejiji. Yakava Chan Chafua Tepeke Ola. Do la very close Nami Afia. Yamasa Yamato. Okay, Maba Chafua. Tama Miva Aduyama Salakofa. Chafua do la very close to me. Ow. Fika Chafua Lafi. Chafua la Kaka Mbogbara. Okay. Okay. So um, I was asking her that when they first first came to this um, community, how far was the ocean from them? And she tells me that the ocean used to be very, very far away from them. But now it is getting closer and even getting cl closer to the road um, that is here. I have another woman who is here with me. Let me speak to her. Daga Oa Aleko Jo Afi Fifia Chachi Homam Lamena. Okay. Well, she says um, that she would have to wait for the church to close before she would lay her mouth and then um, sleep. And as the church service is ongoing, she would have to wait um, outside. So that is, that is a real situation um, on the ground. Let me speak to um, the chief fisherman um, here. And in fact, you own the church, right? Yes, please. Yeah, what's your name, sir? Pastor Wisdom Ejia. So how many people have been sleeping here so far? Uh, they are about 15, 15 that way. Some with their children. Mm. So they are, personally, about 15. But the old ones, they are about 15. Mm. With so, their children, so they will be about, that is 30 that way. Mm. So how, how do they sleep? Because I don't see any mosquito nets. I don't see... Uh, how, how do they, they have, sleep? They have, uh, some have mosquito nets okay. and some don't. So they have to patch with the others. And after that, after the church, they will bring it, they have hide them. So some are in the church, so after the church, they will, they will bring it them out. And it is a difficult task for this uh, solar copper. And now, if you can see, the water I've taken away, the water, uh, the sea is far. So with a few days, he came and destroyed all their properties, their houses and uh, all those things. And now they don't have any place to sleep. And now if it rains, the other part they have to go to, the rain have taken over that place too. So now we are telling the government to come to our aid because we need them now. If we are in trouble and they come to us, we know that they are our helpers. Now, if they can't do anything about it, it means that they don't even take care of us because they are paying their taxes. If they go to the market, if they buy their things from anywhere, they are paying taxes. So with the taxes, we think they can do much more than what we are saying now. Okay, I, I think um, the residents here are living um, the idiomatic expression of being caught between the devil and the deep blue sea, um, where we have the deep blue sea on my left hand side, and then um, the devil being the lagoon which is here, because um, some days, uh, some hours ago, when the tides were high, um, the water from the ocean actually crossed the road here and then entered the lagoon, which is just about 50 meters away from where I'm standing. Let me speak to the chief fisherman here in this community. He is personally affected. In fact, his house, you can just walk through his house and then you see the ocean. If you're in his room, you can hear the roaring um, uh, um, waves from the ocean. Let's speak to him and find out. Uh, 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 how are you coping with this? <laughs> uh, Toby Emmanuel Anumwete is my name. Ah, in verse, we are very, we are almost in a desert now. The sea has devastated everything, spoiled everything around us here, uh, affecting our day-to-day uh, -day, uh, living. Because we are fisher folks, we do fishing for a living. 
But very unfortunately, because of the tidal wave, we can't fish anymore. And uh, living a day with our children is causing water and firewood. We, things have, we, we don't know how to express it. You see, one important thing I have to let the government know, which I believe the government hasn't known yet, is the government belongs to all of us. The sea is very close to the street now, and some just few meters to the lagoon. Immediately the sea enters the lagoon. It's flowing because there's water, the lagoon is there already. The sea will flow into the lagoon as it is happening now. And the lagoon over, over flood. By the flood, it's going to Agbozume. Affecting Agbozume, if we don't take time, it's going to Ho. And it will affect the whole entire country. So we are advising the government to come to our aid immediately. We, do, we don't have even food to eat, you see. Okay. Nothing to wear. This is what I wear in the morning from since yesterday. Okay. My, my things are in the water. I can't change anything, you see. Uh, okay. I, same thing applies to everybody in the community here. Thank you very much for talking to us. Uh, so uh, this old woman you're sitting here, I'm waiting for church service to end. So as a presence and worship, um, those who are in there, many of them, I'm sure, are not really hoping for it to finish any time soon. They have to pray to God. They have to worship their maker and give thanks and praises um, to him. And these old women here are also praying for this church service to end so they can come in there and sleep. Ernest. Thanks all for bringing us uh, live details from uh, Salakope, where the shelter is. Many of them seeking uh, you know, some rest at the uh, church there. And to move this conversation forward, we have uh, Suleimana Isifu, the Director of Research at the Center for Climate and Food Security and Research Fellow at the Hans Rodenberg uh, Institute in Germany. Joy Dip uh, Gupta is also Director, Third Pole Organization. He specializes in climate change and Joy Dip is also a veteran journalist with deep knowledge of COP negotiations. And uh, we're learning, let me start with you, uh, Mr. Joy Depp. We're learning of a U10 by some of the G20 nations in terms of financial pledge to Africa to deal with climate change. How can Ghana uh, position itself to attract some good funding? Well, uh, the report that I have just been seeing uh, is exactly the point that Ghana should be making uh, at the Glasgow COP right now and both before and after because um, as the old lady said to your reporter uh, the ocean used to be very far but it's come much closer so and that is a direct impact of sea level rise which in turn is a direct consequence of climate change and it's obvious that when such a thing happens the government has to find a lot of money to resettle people where will any government especially a developing country government, find this kind of money. This has to come from the polluters. The polluters, which are the rich nations, which have put 80% of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere today uh, since the start of the industrial age. So that's the whole point of the negotiations going on right now in COP26 and has been going on, unfortunately, for a very long time without any resolution. To specifically to your question as to how Ghana or any other country for that matter can get the money, I wish I had the answer. I wish anybody had the answer because then we wouldn't have these protracted decades old negotiations going on without any resolution. As of today, even in COP26, I do not see any resolution happening in this COP on the basic and fundamental question of finance. It looks like it will get deferred to the next COP again. Mm. And why, why is that? Uh, why the sudden change in position by many of the G20 nations, uh, which was not the case ahead of this, this summit? No, it has always been the case that they will talk and talk, but not come up with any money. Uh, so uh, there is a lot of big talk. Uh, there is a lot of big talk in COP26 about countries, big countries going 
net zero in terms of their emissions in year 2050, 2060, 2070, whatever, by which time most of the leaders making those places will be dead anyway, so they don't have to live up to those places. Mm. So the question is, the rich countries are pushing back action, the rich countries are pushing back support, and the developing countries are protesting, and the developing countries should protest. We definitely need a, an international system where a polluter, however rich he or she may be, however rich that country may be, can be held to account. Very well. Can you hold the line for me? Uh, Isifu Suleiman is on the other line with us. He's director of research at the Center for Climate and Food Security. Um, so, I mean, whilst we, the minister talks about a land reclamation project, for instance, as part of the phase two of the Blakusu uh, project, is that environmentally sustainable? Um, thank you very much, uh, and good evening to your cherished uh, viewers. Um, for sure, it is just... Um, a drop in the ocean, I mean, to attempt to reclaim lands that have already been devastated as a result of tidal waves. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the full gamut of the problems that tidal waves pose, you would see that land reclamation is just, I mean, a tip of the iceberg. Because when we talk about tidal waves, we are talking about um, the underground water becoming salty. We are talking about people losing their livelihoods. We are talking about um, the uh, freshwater aquifers being uh, destroyed as a result of the tidal uh, consequences of the tidal waves. So land reclamation is the least of the steps to take when you have a situation such as uh, we are witnessing in Ghana currently. Mm. So we need a comprehensive approach. We need an approach that is very uh, that has very far-reaching uh, implications and not merely going to tackle the issue on the surface, and then the next time we have the problem resurfacing. Mm. So it is time that Ghana sat down and began to talk about climate change into details. Because some of these promises, reclamation of land, resettling people, these are political in nature, because it makes the politician look good. But when it comes to the heavy lifting, the core question about tackling the problem from its roots, most politicians would like to run away from it because that is where the difficulty is. The difficulty is not about, re, re, uh, how do I call it, uh, relocating people. The difficulty is not about uh, just building some walls to shield off the land from the, um, the, 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 the devastating effect of the, of the waves. That is not well, we where the, the, the issue is. The government of the issue actually lies in investing money into research, investing money into um, research that will bring up solutions that will nail the problem once and for all, and not some of these superficial approaches that only make politicians well, look Mr. good. Mr. Suleiman, I want you to hold on. Let's listen to the Lands and Natural Resources, the Works and Housing Minister, I beg your pardon, Francis asensu who says that the 2022 budget presentation will provide details of the second phase of the Blekusu Coastal Protection uh, Project expected to address the perennial tidal flooding in the Ketu South Municipality. It is important to note that in April 2021, a technical team from the, from the Hydrological Services Department of the Ministry, upon my directive, traveled to the affected communities to engage the municipal chief executive and some community leaders on the, on the matter of the implementation of the second phase. I also had the opportunity to lead a technical team to visit those communities to have a first-hand understanding of the matter and the situation on ground. It is envisaged that the completion of the West envisaged under the second phase of the project will cover a minimum coastal stretch of 8,000 meters, that is eight kilometers. And this will surely ensure the total protection of the people of Agavaji, Salakope, Amuchuni, Adina communities, and other affected communities within the constituency that continue to bear the brunt of these occasional disasters. The scope of works under the second phase of Blekusu Coastal Protection Project entails the construction of 37 
armor rock drawings with land reclamation to protect eight kilometers of coastal stretch. The ministry is currently actively working with the Ministry of Finance to raise the needed funding for the implementation of the second phase. I am very hopeful that the finance minister will, 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 will touch on it in his upcoming presentation of the financial statement for, for, for 2022. That's in addition to protecting lives and properties, the works under the Blekuso Coastal Protection Project will protect the beaches and its environs against encroachment by the sea, address the current environmental deterioration, mitigate the social and economic consequences of beach erosion, and strengthen the economic and production base of the area through enhanced fishing and recreational activities. And uh, so that's the Western Housing Minister, uh, Francis Asensu Boachi there. Uh, let me start with you, uh, Gupta. Given the level of erosion that has taken place, uh, how should we approach this? I'm sorry, uh, the audio is bad. Can you repeat your question? Please? Yes, so, so the Western Housing Minister gives details of, you know, what the project entails, covering some eight kilometers uh, 8,000 meters, I beg your pardon. Uh, given the level of erosion that has already taken place, what will be your suggestion on how we should approach this project, the second phase? Yeah, well, this is not, this is not a very sustainable solution. That's obvious. Uh, and part, uh, pardon me for the uh, disturbance in the background. I'm in the cob, which is a very noisy place. Uh, but uh, the, what the point I'm trying to make is, is that this solution is temporary. It probably has to be done right now, but it is not sustainable. How far will you take the communities back? How far from the sea will they go? Okay. With the uh, we are the, you are seeing the kind of high tides you are seeing with the temperature being 1.2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. At current levels of uh, climate change uh, combat. Uh, uh, NDCs, that's the nationally determined contributions, we are heading for 2.7 from 1.2. So at 1.2, you can see the kind of damage that you are seeing. Can you just imagine what will happen at 2.7? So definitely this is not sustainable. At the local level, I think the best possible solution is to really start planting mangroves there. The mangroves are the only solution which will reduce the level, the strength of the high waves during the high tides. And that, I think, is the best adaptation strategy that you could, uh, that the government could adopt right now. Very well. Thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, uh, Joydeep Gupta joining us there on this issue. Uh, Mr. Suleimana, let me uh, take your thoughts on this. Whilst we wait for the project to start, uh, what steps can be taken to alleviate the plight of the people? So for sure, the government needs to put in an immediate uh, solution that is uh, by way of relocating the people and finding ways to get the people to uh, find other alternatives to livelihoods. I mean, this is for sure the interim measure. But as uh, Gupta said, the solution actually is not about reclamation of land in the immediate because with the extent of the rise of the sea, as we are seeing, and almost all predictions are that Africa is almost seeing the highest sea rise, I mean, uh, above the global average, even though we are the least uh, contributors of climate change. Yeah. So with this trend, it means that the sea is going to rise beyond the so-called walls that we are trying to put in place. Mm -hmm. So for sure, what is scientifically uh, proven is that the solution that is going to be put in place by the government currently is just a stopgap measure. So in the media, if you ask me, I would say, yes, government should go ahead, devote funds, and have this project uh, 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 implemented. But then in the long term, as Professor uh, Mr. Gupta rightly suggested, we should be looking at an integrated approach that will incorporate other mechanisms, including 
planting of trees, looking at even introducing crops that have the ability to suck saline from the soil because we know that this kind of trend would lead to contamination of the fresh water, which is only 2% or 3% across the globe. So the, the problem is far bigger than we are seeing. And we don't need a political approach. We need a scientific approach. And that is what we need to drum home. The politicians must know that this problem requires a scientific approach and not a political approach. We'll leave it here. Thank you very much for your time. Suleimana Isifu is the Director of Research, uh, Center for Climate and Food Security, and also a fellow at the Hans Radegen uh, Institute in Germany. Earlier, we heard from Joy Deb Gupta, who is the Director of Third Pole Organization and also specializes in climate change, a veteran journalist with deep knowledge on COP negotiations. This is John News Prime with me, Ernest Smith.